Hi guys, welcome back. So today marks the third video in our series on the inguinal canal uh, and all those kinds of things involving the anterior abdominal uh, wall and things like that. Today is probably going to be a fairly shortish video. We're just going to focus on some of the clinical significant factors involving the inguinal canal. So it's one of those things that's talked about a lot in medicine um, and it can seem quite insignificant. At the end of the day, it's just this tiny little passage that the testes move down. Um, and so it can be hard to understand why so much emphasis is placed on it. Uh, so hopefully this will give it a bit of clinical context and help you to understand why it's important to, to know the features and things of it. Firstly, uh, we touched on this picture before in our last video. Um, this just shows the passage of the testes um, starting up here on the posterior abdominal wall and then descending down just underneath that peritoneum um, before moving down through the inguinal canal. And you can see that um, we get this, sorry, here's the structure here. Um, we notice that there's these structures here that, so if the testes is developing up here, it draws its blood and its nerve supply from vessels and um, structures that are up here, up near the kidney. When the testes starts to descend, it pulls that supply with it. And that supply ends up forming that spermatic cord um, surrounded by all the spermatic fascia that we touched on in the last video. Um, but this is important because it means that blood flow from up here um, comes down to supply of the testy and also nerve supply. So this explains why we get referred pain to damage to the testes. So if someone has a testicular injury, such as a torsion injury um, or a trauma, then they're not going to feel, they don't feel pain down here in the scrotum. What they actually feel, if it's a testicular pain rather than a scrotal pain, um, the testicular pain will refer up to the back. So, for example, if you know someone that's been kicked in the crotch, um, they'll often say that they feel the pain more up in their mid-back um, because the nerves that supply the testy actually arise up here and supply the overlying skin in this region in the posterior abdominal wall as well. So that explains why that pain refers there and it can be helpful diagnostically. Something to keep in mind that if you know you have a young male coming in um, describing really intense lower back pain um, and a feeling of um, almost like nausea and things like that, it's to do with the nerve plexuses that sit up here that um, intertwine with the, the, um, the spermatic cord, sorry. And it, it means that you shouldn't just be looking for abdominal causes of that pain. You need to remember that the pain from the testes will refer there. And this is important because something like a testicular torsion where the testis flips around on itself. So you, you kind of, if this is your spermatic cord and then this is your testy. Um, because it's dangling here, this testy can then spin around on itself and knot this up. And if that knots up, as we say, this has got its blood supply, so the testy can start to necrose. So that's a real medical emergency that needs to be addressed. So just something, if someone comes in with posterior back pain um, and it's a young male, you want to be thinking about testes as well as abdominal causes. So that's one thing. Um, there's also, if I don't have a picture of it, but um, due to the way the, the blood supply overlaps up here, um, pressure from the renal artery can actually compress the testicular um, the testicular vein, um, which can lead to a backflow of, of blood. And so this isn't super clinically critical, I guess, but it's just something to keep in mind that um, you can, if you get sporadic testicular pain, um, one of the things you can look at is whether you're getting some entrapment of the testicular vessels um, underneath the renal artery and the uh, superior mesenteric artery. We'll, we'll cover those arteries in another lecture on um, on blood supply to the abdomen and things like that in the abdominal lay order. But that's just something, that's just another clinical thing. Um, yeah, so that's probably one of the really key things is that the testes, although they sit down here, through because of this passage through the inguinal canal and this passage down from the posterior abdominal wall, they actually will refer pain. They get the supply still from up here in the embryological origin near the kidney. So that's one of the key things. The other key thing is probably a little bit more dramatic, and the and that is the um, that is the concept of a hernia. So this picture here, I'm sorry that the the pic the pictures aren't great. They're quite old, 
Um, it's very hard to find pictures of hernias actually, um, especially big ones like this because often they get solved before they get this big now. There's two types of hernias that we can get when we're talking about an inguinal hernia. So first of all, that's something we need to clarify. We're talking about inguinal hernias here. This is important because you can get very similar looking hernias. So for example, femoral hernias can actually look quite similar to an inguinal hernia. They're in a similar region, um, but usually maybe down here a bit more rather than up here. So we're talking about inguinal hernias here, and we've got two types. We've got indirect, which is the one that you're seeing here. We've also got a direct, which is what you're seeing here. Simple summary, um, an indirect hernia is actually when the, so a hernia first of all is when something is basically protruding through a hole into an area that it shouldn't be. So in this case, in the inguinal hernia, it's abdominal contents are, are moving through into a, a, a place that they shouldn't be into a bulge. An indirect um, inguinal hernia is actually something that's prolapsing through the inguinal ligament and so it can actually prolapse down into the, um, the scrotum. So it's a protrusion through the deep ring of the inguinal canal. Um, so remember that if our canal kind of looks something like this, and then our test is it down here. With the vessels through here, you remember that, um, so the, the deep ring is kind of formed by the punching in of the transversalis fascia. So the fascia is kind of lining here and gets pushed in with the testi to make that first layer of the spermatic cord. But that lying over this still is still the peritoneum, right? So the abdominal contents or your small intestine and large intestine and fat and all those kinds of things are still maintained within the peritoneum and they're not kind of, they don't usually have access to this space. What can happen though is, as we said, the testi arises from this kind of mid area between the peritoneum and the transversalis fascia. And in doing so, they can, they can actually sometimes form a little connection here with this peritoneum. It's not like a hole, it's almost just like, because the testi has kind of been rubbing on the peritoneum so much, it's kind of just made them sticky. And so now the peritoneum now sticks to the surface of the testis. And as the testis starts to push down through, it can sometimes drag part of that peritoneum with that. We call that a um, processus vaginalis. Processus vaginalis with an I, yes. So processus vaginalis, uh, which is basically uh, the any of the peritoneum that gets pulled through with the testi, we call that the processus vaginalis. In most people, that's just gonna seal up and form like a ligament. So it's kind of gonna go, whoop, pull through, pull through the ligament with the, uh, so if that's like the deep ring, that's the, that's the superficial ring. It comes through the testi, but then over time, it kind of closes over. And so it forms just like a nice little dense ligament part of that spermatic cord. That's what will usually happen. If this fails to close, however, so remember this is where all our small intestine and stuff is. I know I'm a very good artist. Um, so if that's our small intestine, um, now it's kind of got a little bridge that it can directly access through that um, processus vaginalis down through the inguinal canal. And so if this doesn't close properly, like we've shown here, so we're going from that to that, if this remains open, then those contents are then able to quite easily herniate down into this inguinal canal and form something like this. This is obviously quite an extreme example. Um, often they'll just present as a little lump here or something like that, just on this um, near the superficial ring of the inguinal canal. So like, so somewhere around here, you'll see some kind of bulging usually, or really anywhere along here, um, you'll see that bulge. So that's called an indirect inguinal hernia. And it's a bit odd that the indirect one is the one that actually goes through the inguinal canal. So um, the way that I remember it is that indirect is actually the one that's most related to inguinal. Um, and it's one that is directly prolapsing through that deep ring. 
That's in contrast to a direct inguinal hernia. So I'm sorry about this here. That was had to be removed for copyright reasons. But um, basically what's happening here is that there's no... Um, it's not directly entering into the inguinal canal here. So it's not really what you'd call... So it's not entering the inguinal canal. It's just a hernia within the inguinal region, which is, you know, this whole kind of region here. And it's basically... A, you can tell, like, it's much more of a diffuse bulge. So it's not actually entering... The scrotum's fully intact here. Um, there's no prolapse into the scrotum. That's all normal. Um, and whereas this is kind of like you can see that this person's lost quite a lot of weight along here because it's all come down and entered into this testes, uh, sorry, into the scrotum. Here, it's much more of just a diffuse bulging. I should make note as well, these are both bilateral and often, often you just have unilateral. You don't have to have bilateral. But the bilateral um, cases kind of are a bit easy to see, I guess, as well, a bit more dramatic. So this is, in this direct hernia, it's this very diffuse kind of swelling, and it's actually, ra it, rather than being uh, something prolapsing through the inguinal canal, it's actually a, um, it's basically taking advantage of sloppy muscles. Um, so it's a portion of the intestine that it's actually protruding directly through just a weak point in the abdominal wall. Um, and this is above the inguinal ligament. So our inguinal ligament is actually kind of running probably... You know, you can probably see his aces there. His pubic, it's a bit hard to see because I'd say that this is actually prolapsing over it, but the pubic tubercle is probably somewhere around there. And so your inguinal ligament's probably going to be there, and you can see that it's entering into it above the inguinal ligament. Um, this one, the direct ones are often painless. Um, and as I say, it's, did I put that out there? Oh, my apologies. One of the photos appears to have not made it through. Um, but basically, it's rather than actually... Hang on, maybe I can I can pull one in for you right now. Here we go. So this was supposed to have been in before. It must have accidentally been missed. So what we can see here, so this is the normal patient, and um, as we see, peritoneum, which we've talked about before, the inguinal canal through here, and then the musculature and the histomepigastric vessels. Indirect hernia is what we talked about before. So this is that kind of, this is the process vaginalis that's closed over, and so you can see that there's no way through for the contents to kind of move into this inguinal canal. What we get with an indirect inguinal hernia is that, that there's that patent vag, uh, processes vaginalis, um, which allows contents to move through and project into the inguinal um, ring and into the inguinal canal. Whereas this direct one, it's kind of pushing through over the top instead and just making use of those weak muscles that um, are arising here. So this is your rectus abdominis here. These are your, your six pack abs. Um, and so it's a weakness kind of in this connection here that leads to uh, the projection through the abdominal walls. You can go into a lot more detail with how, with where all these different um, inguinal hernias are occurring. Um, there's a special triangle that um, includes a couple of different vessels and things like that. that um, surgeons basically look for when they're doing surgery on these structures laparoscopically, so with a camera. Uh, I'm not going to go into those details today, but uh, these are kind of the key details that you need to know, that a direct inguinal hernia is, rather than going moving through the inguinal canal, it's just pushing through weak muscles in the anterior abdominal wall, whereas an indirect hernia is actually prolapsing through the inguinal canal and can enter into the scrotum. That's all for today. Uh, thanks for watching. And if you've got any questions or if there's any topics you'd like to, me to cover, please feel free to uh, listen below in the comments. And uh, as always, uh, there'll be more videos coming out. This is the final video on our Inguinal Canal series, um, but there'll be more, some more videos coming out soon. So stay tuned for that. Thanks, guys.